Hey everyone, today we're diving into one of the most dramatic and intense moments in history, the First Jewish-Roman War, also known as the Great Jewish Revolt. This war, which happened between 66 and 74 CE, was the first of three major Jewish uprisings against the Roman Empire. It all went down in the province of Judea, and the aftermath was devastating. Jewish towns were wiped out, people were displaced, and the Romans even destroyed the famous Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So how did this all kick off? Well, let's set the scene. It's 66 CE, and the Roman Empire is ruled by Emperor Nero. Things in Judea had been simmering for a while due to oppressive Roman governors, widening social gaps between the rich and poor, and tensions between Jewish and Roman religious beliefs. To make matters worse, there were also protests over taxes, and violent clashes broke out in cities where Jews and pagans lived side by side. One of the final straws was when the Roman governor, Gessius Florus, straight up seized money from the Jewish temple treasury. This wasn't just any money, this was sacred. That move, along with the arrest of many key Jewish figures, set off a wave of rebellion in Jerusalem. Things escalated quickly. Rebel forces even managed to capture the Roman garrison, forcing Roman officials and the pro-Roman king, Herod Agrippa II, to flee the city. To crush this rebellion, the Roman Empire sent Cestius Gallus, the legate of Syria, with a full army, including the powerful Legion XII Fulminata. At first, the Romans seemed to have the upper hand, even conquering the city of Jaffa. But the rebels weren't going down without a fight. They ambushed the Romans at the Battle of Beth Horon, killing 6,000 Roman soldiers and capturing the legion's prized eagle standard, the Aquila. It was a massive blow to the Roman forces. After that victory, the Jews set up a provisional government in Jerusalem. Leaders like the former high priest Ananus ben Ananus, Joseph ben Gurion, and Joshua ben Gamla took charge. In Galilee, a man named Yosef ben Matityahu was chosen as the commander of the rebel forces there. However, not everyone was on the same page. In Jerusalem, Menahem ben Yehuda, the leader of a radical faction known as the Sicarii, tried to seize control of the city but failed, leading to his execution and the expulsion of his followers. Meanwhile, Rome wasn't done yet. Emperor Nero handed over the task of crushing the rebellion to one of his top generals, Vespasian, who marched into Galilee in 67 CE with four legions. With the help of King Agrippa II's forces, Vespasian quickly took over major Jewish strongholds like Jodapatha and Terakia. Many rebels and refugees fled to Jerusalem, which created even more chaos and infighting among the different Jewish factions in the city. By 69 CE, things had taken a dramatic turn. Vespasian was called back to Rome, where he was crowned emperor, and his son Titus took over the siege of Jerusalem. The siege was brutal, lasting seven months. Factions within Jerusalem even burned their own food supplies, making things worse for everyone. Finally, in the summer of 70 CE, the Romans broke through the city's defenses. Jerusalem fell, and with it, the Second Temple was destroyed, an event that would change Jewish history forever. Titus then returned to Rome, but the war wasn't over yet. The Roman legion ex Fretensis continued to hunt down remaining Jewish strongholds, including the famous fortress of Masada, which they captured by 74 CE, effectively ending the revolt. The aftermath of this war was devastating for the Jewish population. Thousands were killed or displaced, many were sold into slavery, and the destruction of the temple threw the entire Jewish community into turmoil. It was a defining moment in the relationship between the Jews and the Roman Empire, and it set the stage for further conflicts down the line. And this whole situation traces back to the reign of King Herod the Great, who ruled Jerusalem from 37 BCE to 4 BCE. Herod was infamous for his ruthlessness. He had pretty much anyone with a claim to the throne executed, even his own wife and her entire family. He built up a new nobility class, loyal only to him, and even appointed new high priests who had no ties to the previous Hasmonean dynasty. 
When Herod died, his relatives started fighting over who would control the region, which only made things worse for everyone. Herod's rule also left behind an economic mess. When his massive construction projects ended, all the workers who depended on them were left unemployed and struggling. This led to riots, and the lack of strong leadership after his death just added fuel to the fire. By 6 CE, the region officially became part of the Roman Empire. The transition wasn't smooth though. The Romans tried to impose a census and new taxes, which led to even more revolts, like the one led by Judas of Galilee. For a while, things calmed down, but by 37 CE, under Emperor Caligula, tensions were rising again, especially with the spread of Greek culture and Roman law clashing with Jewish traditions. And things were really heating up, and now we're getting into the full-scale outbreak of the rebellion. So, in 66 CE, things hit a breaking point in Caesarea. According to Josephus, a group of Greeks from a merchant house stirred up trouble by sacrificing birds right in front of a synagogue. This really escalated tensions, and soon, Eliezer ben Hanania, a Jewish temple official, stopped the usual prayers and sacrifices for the Roman emperor. On top of that, frustrations over high taxes were adding fuel to the fire, and attacks on Roman citizens and anyone seen as a traitor started happening all over Jerusalem. Things really spiraled when the Roman procurator Gessius Florus ordered his troops to breach the Jewish temple. He even had his soldiers take 17 talents of silver from the temple treasury, claiming it was for the emperor. This was like throwing gasoline on an already burning situation. The people in Jerusalem were outraged and began mocking Florus by passing around a basket as if they were collecting donations for him like he was some poor beggar. Florus didn't take this lightly. The next day, he sent Roman soldiers into the city, and they arrested and crucified several city leaders, many of whom were actually Roman citizens. At this point, the Judean rebels were done playing nice. They armed themselves, overran the Roman military garrison in Jerusalem, and forced the pro-Roman King Herod Agrippa II and his sister Berenice to flee the city. Things were so out of control that the rebels even went after Roman symbols and pro-Roman officials across the region, wiping out any signs of Roman control. Meanwhile, the Sicaria, an extremist rebel group, surprised the Roman forces at Masada and took control of the fortress there. Now, initially, this uprising wasn't just about the Jews versus the Romans. There were a lot of internal divisions among the Jews themselves, between those who wanted to rebel and those who didn't. But in the chaos, a lot of lives were lost, including that of former high priest Ananias. Even the Roman garrison was trapped and couldn't offer any help. They eventually surrendered under the condition of safe passage, but rebel leader Eliezer wasn't having it. He ordered the massacre of all the surrendered soldiers, except for their commander Matilius, who was forced to convert to Judaism. At this point, the Christians in Jerusalem, following the advice of some of their leaders, fled the city and took refuge in Pella before the war really kicked into high gear. Now, let's talk about Rome's reaction to all of this. The legate of Syria, Cestius Gallus, was sent in to restore order with a force of around 30,000 to 36,000 soldiers, including the Syrian Legion 12 Fulminata, and some other units. His campaign started off well enough, he captured a few towns and even reached Jerusalem. But for some reason, Gallus pulled back just when he had a chance to strike a decisive blow. That turned out to be a huge mistake. As his troops were retreating, they were ambushed at the Battle of Beth Horon by the Judean rebels, who dealt one of the worst defeats the Roman Empire had ever seen from a rebellious province. Around 6,000 Roman soldiers were killed, and the Legion 12 even lost its Aquila, the sacred Roman standard. It was a massive blow to Roman pride. Meanwhile, the Judean forces, emboldened by their victory, decided to try their luck with the Hellenistic city of Ascalon. But things didn't go as planned. The rebels suffered a huge defeat there, losing around 8,000 men, and a lot of Jewish residents in Ascalon were killed by their Greco-Syrian and Roman neighbors in retaliation. 
After the defeat of Gallus, a people's assembly was called in Jerusalem, and a provisional government was formed under the guidance of Simeon ben Gamliel. The government began fortifying the city in preparation for what they knew would be a serious Roman retaliation. A variety of leaders were appointed to different regions, with Josephus, yes, the same one who would later write all of this down, being put in charge of the forces in Galilee. While all this was going on, a power struggle erupted within the rebel ranks. Menahem ben Yehuda, leader of the Sicarii, tried to seize control of Jerusalem but failed miserably. He was executed, and the Sicarii were driven out of the city and back to their fortress at Masada. Simon bar Giora, a radical peasant leader, was also kicked out of Jerusalem and eventually joined forces with other rebel factions in Masada. And now we get to Vespasian. Emperor Nero sent this seasoned general to crush the rebellion once and for all. Vespasian arrived with his legions and was soon joined by his son Titus. Together, they commanded a force of over 60,000 soldiers and began systematically taking back control of Galilee. Josephus, who was in charge of the resistance in Galilee, faced a tough choice. Many of the wealthier towns surrendered without a fight while other places like Yotapata and Gamla resisted and were brutally subdued by the Romans. By 68 CE, Vespasian had crushed most of the resistance in the north and set up his headquarters in Caesarea Maritima. Rather than directly attacking Jerusalem, he focused on clearing the coastal cities and securing the supply lines. During this time, many Jewish rebels were either killed or sold into slavery, and the rebellion's remaining forces regrouped in Jerusalem, which quickly descended into civil war between the various rebel factions. As the Roman campaign in Judea pressed forward in the spring of 68, Vespasian, who commanded the legions, launched a well-organized effort to recapture key strongholds. Towns like Afik, Lydda, Hafne, and Jaffa fell to the Romans, restoring Roman control over large swaths of Judea. Vespasian's forces continued their advance into the regions of Idumea and Perea, and eventually to the rugged terrain of the Judean and Sumerian highlands, where Simon bar Giora's faction posed a serious threat to Roman authority. By mid-69, towns like Gophna, Akrapta, Beetle, Ephraim, and Hebron had also fallen under Roman control. While the war in Judea raged, a power struggle was unfolding back in Rome. Emperor Nero's unpredictable behavior had finally alienated his most loyal supporters. In mid-68, a conspiracy by the Roman Senate, the Praetorian Guard, and key military leaders led to Nero's ousting. After the Senate declared him an enemy of the state, Nero fled, and, with his life in disarray, ended it by suicide. His death set off a whirlwind of political chaos. Galba, the governor of Spain, quickly ascended to power but was murdered just months later by Otho, a rival, throwing Rome into a period of civil war that became known as the Year of the Four Emperors. In this time of crisis, Vespasian, who had remained neutral in the political strife, was hailed as emperor by his legions in 69. His popularity among the soldiers and political backing encouraged him to return to Rome to challenge Vitellius, who had seized power after Otho's defeat. Vespasian left his son Titus to oversee the final stages of the Judean campaign while he prepared to take control of the Roman Empire. Titus, now in charge of the Roman legions, set his sights on Jerusalem, the heart of the Judean rebellion. His army advanced through the region, leaving a trail of destruction and causing mass displacement of Jewish civilians. The city, once a symbol of Jewish autonomy, was now teetering on the brink. Inside Jerusalem, Jewish rebel factions were more focused on infighting than on the Romans at their gates. The Zealots, who had been fighting among themselves for control, were divided between John of Giscala and Simon bar Giora. While the Zealots clashed within the city, the Romans prepared for a siege. The Roman army encircled Jerusalem, turning the siege into a stalemate. Unable to breach the fortified city, they resorted to a brutal psychological strategy. They dug a trench around the city, building a wall that mirrored the city's defenses, trapping the inhabitants inside. Any attempt to flee was met with gruesome punishment. 
those captured were crucified on the wall, with hundreds perishing daily. The internal strife among the Jewish rebels worsened. In a drastic move, the zealots, eager to force the city's defenders into fighting the Romans rather than surrendering, destroyed the food reserves. This plunged Jerusalem into a state of famine, with both civilians and soldiers starving to death. Tacitus, a historian of the era, noted the staggering number of people trapped in the city, with men and women alike taking up arms. Everyone who could fight did so, choosing death over the prospect of exile. As the siege dragged on into the summer of 70, Titus found a weak spot in Jerusalem's defenses. After months of assaults, the Roman legions breached the city's outer walls. The third wall, hastily built before the siege, fell first. Then they penetrated the more critical second wall. The defenders, led by John of Giscala and Simon Bargiora, were divided, with John holding out in the temple and Simon's forces entrenched in the upper city. However, the Roman onslaught was too much. By late July, the temple was set ablaze, marking the collapse of the last stronghold of Jewish resistance. The destruction of Jerusalem was near total. Roman soldiers reduced the city to rubble, raising all three of its walls and demolishing the temple. Thousands were either killed or enslaved. Some of the stones that were toppled from the city's walls can still be seen today. John of Giscala surrendered at the fortress of Yotapata, while Simon Bargiur was captured at the site where the temple once stood. In a display of Roman triumph, the sacred treasures of the temple, including the menorah, were paraded through the streets of Rome. John of Giscala was sentenced to life imprisonment, while Simon Bargiur was executed. But even after the fall of Jerusalem, resistance in Judea persisted in isolated strongholds. Titus, now preparing to leave for Rome, entrusted the task of quelling the last pockets of rebellion to the military governor, Sextus Lucilius Bossus. Bossus led the Roman forces in capturing the remaining fortresses, including Herodium and Machaerus, crushing the remaining rebel factions. Bossus, however, fell ill and died before completing the campaign, leaving the final battle to his successor, Lucius Flavius Silva. Silva moved against Masada, the last bastion of Jewish resistance, in the autumn of 72. Masada was a well-fortified stronghold perched high above the Dead Sea, and its defenders, the Sicarii, refused to surrender. Silva, commanding Legio ex Fratensis and thousands of Jewish prisoners, built camps around the fortress and encircled it. After months of siege, the Romans finally breached the walls in 73 only to find that almost all of Masada's defenders had committed suicide rather than face capture. The aftermath of the war was devastating for the Jewish population of Judea. Entire towns and villages were wiped out, and much of the region was left in ruins. The toll on the Jewish people was immense. According to estimates, about one-third of the Jewish population of Judea perished, while many others were captured, sold into slavery, or displaced. Jewish life in Jerusalem, in particular, was nearly obliterated, with Josephus claiming that over a million people died during the siege, though modern scholars debate this figure. Despite this destruction, Jewish life persisted. Some regions, such as Galilee, experienced less devastation, and cities like Sepphoris and Tiberias managed to survive relatively unscathed. However, Judea proper, especially Jerusalem, was left desolate. In the wake of the war, Roman veterans were settled in newly established colonies, further tightening Rome's grip on the province. Vespasian, now securely in power as emperor, granted city status to Caesarea and garrisoned a permanent Roman legion in Jerusalem. Although the Jewish revolt was crushed and the Second Temple lay in ruins, Jewish culture and religion endured. With the temple destroyed, Jewish religious life shifted toward the synagogue, and the rabbinic tradition, which had been developing prior to the war, became the foundation of post-temple Judaism. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, a leading Pharisee, established a new center of Jewish learning in Yavni, ensuring that Judaism would survive and adapt to its new reality without the temple. Vespasian's rise to power was cemented by his victory in Judea, and the Flavian dynasty used this triumph to bolster its legitimacy.
The Arch of Titus in Rome, which still stands today, commemorates the Roman victory and the plunder of Jerusalem's treasures. This victory marked not just the end of the Jewish revolt but also the beginning of a new era in Roman-Jewish relations, setting the stage for future conflicts such as the Bar Kokhba revolt, which would erupt in 132 CE.